Hello, everyone, and welcome to Voices, Rebellion, and Fiction with Lila Rafi. I'm Allison Carvalho, the events manager for Barbara's Bookstores. Barbara's has been a Chicago institution since 1963, and we are incredibly excited to be bringing you this event. We're a family owned and operated bookstore, and we pride ourselves on creating community spaces within our stores as well as out of them, like these events. Before we move on to our discussion, I want to give you guys a quick tour of Crowdcast for those of you who haven't been here before. First of all, we are still at least somewhat new to virtual events. We have been doing these events since June, but we're still kind of getting the hang of it. So if we're having any technical difficulties, please, please, please bear with us. We will get ourselves back up and running as quickly as possible. Please make sure to chat um, on the side with fellow book lovers. Um, we will be providing links and information in that space as well. Uh, if you notice that your video is experiencing any lag, make sure to click the little gear button and switch your HD setting to 360. We have learned that that tends to help with any kind of lag you might be experiencing. The last 10 to 15 minutes of the event will be open for questions. So please make sure if you have one that you put it in the ask a question function at the bottom of your screen. Um, all you have to do is just click on ask a question and a little pop up window will show up and you could type your question in there. You also can upvote other people's questions. So if maybe you don't have a but you want to see what other people want to ask, you can go there, click on it, it'll open up and you'll be able to read what other people are asking and you can kind of thumbs up their questions and it'll move it up in the queue. If you, um, oh, actually the most, one of the most important things, make sure that you click on that little green button that's right under there to purchase Spring, this incredible, beautiful book we're gonna be talking about today. Um, for anyone attending the event, you will get a 10% off discount using the code EVENTS at checkout. And lastly, we wanna make sure that this is an informative event, so please make sure to be conscious and caring to your fellow book lovers throughout the event and in the chat. All right, I think that's everything. It's time to bring up our author. Our author for today is an Iranian American woman of Iranian immigrant parents, and she works for the ACLU. She grew up in Washington, DC, has lived in Cairo, and currently lives in New York. Spring is her very first novel. Let's bring to the screen Lila Rafi. Hang on. Hi. There we go. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Doing well, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate having you. No problem, thank you for having me. Of course. Alrighty, let's get going. So can you tell us a little bit about your writing journey? Sure, well, I I feel like I started writing pretty young. Um, I think I was in like third grade when I started um, making up um, you know, I think I got into it early and then I kind of set it aside for many years. Um, like throughout high school, I would write bad poetry, things like that. And then I think from about college until I was like 28, I had writer's block. <laughs> so it was like, I knew that I, was, I should be writing. I wanted to be writing. I had little blips of like, almost writing, but I just never really did it until finally I sat down and just made myself do it. And um, it was kind of a long process to get there. I think many factors <laughs> went into that. I think honestly what happened was I was really like, I was like going through a, I guess a third quarter life crisis or something. Um, I was like trying to figure out what I was gonna do. I had, you know, had gone through a really bad breakup and I was like pretty much going through a breakdown and finally I was like, I need to write this. And it was kind of like, you know, I feel like I was at rock bottom and that was like the only thing that could have made me start writing and finishing a piece like this. I honestly, I don't think I could would have been writing at all if I was like out having a good time enjoying my life it was only out of like despair <laughs> I started writing. but yeah I think that's a, I think that tends to be the case with a lot of writers like I think they talk they always talk so much about like the tortured artist 
and mm-hmm. how like art kind of comes from those darker places where you kind of have to delve into your feelings a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes I read things that, that I wrote when I was happier and it's usually pretty crappy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very shallow stuff, like the beautiful scenery, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's a whole lot of hearts and flowers and not a lot of actual like delving into the deep stuff, right? Exactly. <laughs> you don't want to when you're feeling good. So. I mean, that's actually very real. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you're kind of good. You're like, I'm good, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I don't need to do anything to make me feel any of the other feelings. I don't want to feel those. Exactly. I feel good. Right. <laughs> no, that's very, very real. <laughs> So your book focuses on three people who are living through the through these kind of extraordinary circumstances. Um, Could you talk a little bit more about the choice to set the story during the Arab Spring um, and your inspiration for the book? Yeah, so the inspiration for the setting of being in during the Arab Spring came because I was there actually at the time I was in Cairo. Um, I was in grad school there studying at the American University in Cairo and, um, you know, just accidentally stumbled upon the revolution. And and I remember like at the time knowing that it was a really big moment, obviously, but like, I remember just like making notes to myself, like I need to write about this one day, you know, I didn't know like in what capacity it would be, but I I felt like it was something that I needed to hold on to. so I did. And then when I finally started writing many years later, um, or actually it wasn't that many years later, it just kind of, I have no concept of time anymore. As we I probably don't think want. any of us do, honestly. Like, yeah. We're all kind of on that struggle bus. <laughs> Everything feels like it was many years ago. But, um, but anyway, so <laughs> I when I started writing about it, I think because I was I was just new to writing anything long form, especially a novel. And so I was like very intimidated by the process. And I feel like I had kind of a perfect frame as a beginner um, in the revolution because it was 18 days. I did one chapter for each day. So there's 18 chapters in the book. And I feel like it just kind of made a perfect um, kind of like template for me as I was like trying to figure out how this writing thing goes. Um, So yeah, it really came piece by piece to me, but somehow figured it out. (laughs) I mean, isn't that all what we're doing right now? We're all just trying to figure it out. (laughs) I feel like I've I've missed the last last part of your question. What was that on? Mainly just like how, kind of like the backdrop of the pro like having having the protest as a backdrop but it makes sense that it was more that the protests were the inspiration and mm-hmm. that like the human stories kind of grew out of the um grew out of the protest versus it being that like the human stories came first and then you chose for it to be set there it makes sense that it I, kind of those stories kind of grew out of it naturally i think that it was really parallel actually because i I really liked the idea of having personal stories that kind of mirrored the art, the political arc that was going on. Cause like there was a lot of hope and like passion and, you know, change and maybe like this false sense of victory. um, And then followed by, you know, of course we all know what happened after that wasn't as great as we thought it would be. So I wanted to capture kind of similar feelings um, going on in my character's personal stories as well. So I think that it just was like a matter of like puzzle pieces, just fitting together these like different kind of um, perspectives in a way that kind of made sense. Yeah, that was actually, that leads me into my next question. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask a bit about kind of these three main characters. Um, So we have Sammy, Suad and Jamila. And all of them are living under obviously very, very different circumstances. And I was curious about kind of how the ideas for these characters came about. Um, so they all kind of, 
I think I, I started with Sammy and the central relationship between Sammy and Rose. That's what I really started with. And then Jamila and Suad flowed as I was writing. Um, so I didn't really start with the idea that I would have these other storylines. Um, but I think that they came out really organically and I think I'm glad that they did. Um, <laughs> so I think that with Sammy and Rose, I felt like it was kind of a relationship, this idea of like, you know, I don't want to be stereotypical, but you know, a man from like a conservative background, you know, um, possibly Muslim or, you know, other religions, um, dating somebody who's not from that background. Um, I feel like it's just a very common story of like culture clash, um, I remember like Googling it and there, I saw so many sad stories on like online forums that nobody's ever heard of. And I was like, wow, this is such a common storyline. And I wanted to write about it because it was so like you could feel people's pain through these anonymous posts. And I don't want to say that it was all um, inspired by posts. It, it definitely was inspired by um, real experiences as well. but. That's kind of how it formed the main story formed to me. It was just kind of, um, you know, like this is something big that I feel like I I hadn't been reading about enough. And then the other stories, um, I guess Jamila came first. I has have always been attracted to a character, the character of like a domestic servant. Um, I really like the perspective that. A character in that role can have like you know on the outside looking in kind of so I feel like they kind of make the perfect narrators because they're part of the storyline but not really they're you know they're there in the scene but ignored at the same time a lot of the time so I naturally kind of started writing this character who was in that role and based on my own experiences I filled in the character so she's a re refugee from Sudan um, you know, I kind of went off of what I knew from my experience in Cairo, because when I worked there, I worked for a refugee aid organization and worked on resettlement. So I feel like I worked with many women who were in the same shoes as Jamila, my character, and they really inspired her. I feel like I have like the face of one woman in mind, the story of another one, you know. I'm like fitting together all of these different people that I encountered um, in one character. Um, and then Suad, Suad the mother, she did not start out being, um, like when I started writing her, I didn't think that she was going to be somebody that you ended up rooting for, but you kind of do. I wouldn't say that oh, you, yeah. yeah, I think like the story really gets into her character and even though she's still an annoying, woman <laughs> at the end <laughs> we kind of like understand her more and yeah, you know like moms moms get like that you know right like they they have they imagine and have such a vision of what their kid is gonna do and who they're gonna be and like their understanding of the world and it's hard to watch the change happen in real time <laughs> so i felt like i was super exactly for her I was like, poor Scott. That's good. Yeah, I was, that's what I, I was surprised. <laughs> totally, yeah. You just want, kind of want something to go right for her in the end because you kind of realize that nothing is under the surface. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, oh, this poor woman, she's just doing her best. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about Sammy. Uh, so it was interesting that you kind of mentioned that the – part of the impetus for writing this came from a quarter life crisis. Cause I feel like Sammy was definitely going through a quarter life crisis. Yeah, for sure. Um, and like, I feel like a lot of what he was struggling with was kind of the expectations that were being placed upon him by the women around him, like his mom and his girlfriend, as well as like the societal expectations that are there. Um, and for him, what, what I found really interesting was that protest kind of becomes a form of escape from those expectations. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to hear a little bit about kind of that idea of protesting and like 
what protesting brings not just as far as like the change it can create but what it can cha what it can do for the person that is protesting and how that kind of affected him as a character sure well one of the things that came out of my um quarter life crisis was extreme anxiety <laughs> like i i have like <laughs> anxiety disorder probably but that i feel like I tried to capture that with Stanny because I feel like I know what it's like to feel like you're being pulled in all these different directions and it feels very paralyzing. And um, you know, you don't know which way to look. I feel like I was trying to capture that with um, the character of Sammy. And in terms of protest, I feel like when you have anxiety or you're in a situation like that, there are certain things that just help you be present and kind of like quell the anxiety for a while. Um, for me on like a smaller scale, I think like pets help do it. It's just like being in a certain situation that makes you get out of your head. And I feel like protests are similar in that way because it's like this situation that is not like normal life and it's so big and there's so many millions of things happening around you that you don't have a second to think about your worries, you know? So I was trying to get at that type of feeling with Sammy. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I know what it's like to feel freed by having your mind just shut off for a second or like think about, you know, to which direction your next step is going to be like literally your next step, not like your life, <laughs> your life, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so yeah, I feel like that's that's the role of the protest there. I also think the protests for Sammy represent kind of like an area of life that he never saw himself getting involved with. I don't think Sammy ever pictured himself being in those types of situations. He wasn't particularly political. Um, even if he was political, I think the whole state of the country had been kind of stagnant for a long time. Um, for the most part. So I think for Sammy, when he gets involved with the protests, it's like, ooh, I'm like, I'm really breaking the rules. I'm doing something I never would have imagined myself doing. Um, and it parallels his relationship with Rose as well. You know, he's treading dangerous territory, breaking the rules, you know, doing something for the first time. So mm -hmm. the protest, I think, is parallel in those ways too. Oh, yeah, definitely. Speaking of Rose, <laughs> she is she is a character. <laughs> yeah. And it was really interesting because I felt like her her view of Cairo, I thought, was really interesting because she kind of looked at it through this kind of idyllic view and she kind of mm -hmm. saw the world around her, I think, obviously coming from a very privileged place of being an American in Cairo and kind of had this almost laissez-faire approach to everything. Um, and so I was curious about with this story, like taking place in Egypt and in Cairo, um, what was important about making, about including an American in the story and kind of having that perspective? Um, I think for me, it, based on my own experience, as an American, as somebody who went to school with a bunch of Americans, I feel like I needed to include it for this story in particular um, because it was just, it's probably the most real experience to me. Um, I'm the closest to that kind of perspective. I feel like I met many people like Rose. I myself am like Rose too. I also had an idyllic view of Cairo too. Um, so, you know, I, I did think that it was an important perspective to add just because it was something that was there. There were so many um, expats in Cairo before the revolution, especially Egypt or Cairo was kind of like this big hub for journalists, for um, NGO workers, for students, like everybody in the States who wanted to study Arabic would go to Cairo. And, um, you know, so you would just see so many people like that. And most, and not to like paint every single person the same way, but you know, most people that I encountered loved living there a lot, including myself, but like, 
You know, I always think that when I hear people um, denigrating the Middle East, as they often do, and they're like, why would any woman want to go there? I'm like, I knew I am a woman who loved living there. I know so many women who just American women who just loved it too. So, you know, I feel like almost like that's kind of like another voice that needs to be heard too. The American who loves living in a place like that. (laughs) And I also wanted to really juxtapose her perception of everything that was going on with Sammy's. I think Rose's perspective is, is important because she is an outsider in that when she is hearing, there's a lot of propaganda during that time, rumors, and Rose is kind of the one, the American who like rolls her eyes and is like, oh, this is bullshit, you know? Um, And I feel like that was something important because you get kind of the knee jerk response from Sammy, who's like, what do you mean? You you know, why are you acting like you know everything about this country? Which of course is valid, but her comments also make him question things, you know, for the first time. She has like a very different perspective and it's not one that he's used to hearing. So. I think that she was necessary for those reasons. Yeah. And that, that a hundred percent makes sense, especially because it was kind of funny. Cause I was like, I'd have these cringy moments while reading about her, but I'd also be like, I also know a hundred percent that that would be me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I probably identified with her more than I identified with most of the other characters. And it, oh, was, right. like, it was like, yeah, yeah, that yeah. definitely would have been my vibe. <laughs> it's all meaning, you know? Exactly. And there's and that's the thing is like, it's not necessarily to say that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that there are people that that's just where their experience and that's how they see the world and that's how they experience it. And there is validity to that for sure. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's talk a bit about Jamila. Um, so she is Rose's maid and she is a Sudanese refugee um, who is trying to get re- um, resettled. Um, and her story was just, it was pretty heart-wrenching, especially these struggles against pe- men who are taking, kind of taking advantage of the situation and tormenting her. Um, and I know that there's many women who kind of struggle in, in a variety of loca- locales and situations. They're struggling just to kind of feel safe and having to make choices not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to, because of that, because of that need for safety. Mm-hmm. Um, could you talk a bit about kind of your research, which I know you had said was from your work with the refugees, but a little bit about that experience um, and how that is reflected in her struggle. Sure. So with Jamila, um, yeah, like I said, there were many women that I encountered who inspired her. And I think personally, their stories really moved me, the actual women that I encountered. They really affected me because they also started chipping away at my idyllic view of Egypt. Um, You know, not to, like, I still adore Egypt and, you know, it's my favorite place in the world. But, um, you know, before I was really hearing all of these horrible stories all the time, it's not that I didn't know that those things were happening. It just kind of hits you in the face that you're like, wow, this is a very normal experience for a, you know, a refugee woman from Sudan, which is like what many women, you know, many women fit that profile there. So you see women like that all around, but they're going through these like, you know, terrible experiences that you would just never believe are so commonplace and are so, you know, they go on silent and, you know, unaccounted for. So to me, that was really moving. Like, I remember going to bed at night and just thinking, like, what is happening? Again, I think that's my anxiety. (laughs) Like, what, what horrible things are happening around me? Or, you know, I was even, like, afraid. I remember once, like, being in an elevator with, like, you know, several men and being like, oh, I'm going to get out and wait for the next, you you know, it just made me afraid, made me paranoid, made me think about things that I hadn't thought of before. So to me personally, I feel like I needed to explore that. It was just something that really spoke to me as a writer. Um, So there were, 
there are many, you know, motivations involved with that. I think in terms of piecing her character together, um, with women that I met there, there were little tidbits that were really common threads. Like for example, um, you know, having a stalker, that was something that, you know, so many women had to deal with and there is nobody that you can run to as a refugee, you know, the police aren't there for you. Um, you know, you're kind of the best you can hope for is to fly under the radar. So you can't really do anything to call attention to yourself, which is, you know, seeking help would normally do. Um, so yeah, that was, um, yeah, that was something that also really spoke to me that I, I felt like it was important to talk about as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was really, it was really, um, it was something that especially with everything like the Me Too movement and stuff like that, I think it's important to talk about not just the way that, especially for American audiences and for women in America, like we're dealing with a lot of struggles, but kind of looking at it from a bigger picture perspective of how the world treats women in general, I think is so important. So I thought it was just really a lovely um, aspect of the story, even though it was like so sad and kind of harrowing, but I thought it was also so important and so beautifully and beautifully written as well. Thank you. Really beautifully written. Um, I also wanted to add with the resettlement yeah. process itself, that itself mm -hmm. was pretty eye opening to me. Um, Cause when I worked there, I was just an intern when I worked there, when I worked for this organization that did resettlement, I was an intern and my job was like the gatekeeper between this refugee and whether they could have a new life, you know, somewhere else. And um, it's, you know, it's, of course, it's not as direct. My role was not as direct as that, but there's just so many steps in this like incredibly bureaucratic process. It seems impossible to actually get resettled anywhere. Like it is just, you know, it's luck. It's like, is your application on top of the pile one day? You know, did a fan sweep it away? Or, you know, it's like, it's about was luck. that person feeling particularly, like was that per, was the person that was kind of your, um, your liaison particularly moved by your story or right. not? Like and that was the thing too. Like it was, it was so crazy to me that like, I was the one who had to make these decisions, you know, whether somebody was, you know, fit for resettlement or not. And, um, you know, everybody's story was so traumatic, you know? I mean, of course, like whatever led them to be refugees in the first place and then what they're going through living in their second country as well is usually not very pleasant. So, um, it was just absurd to me. I'm like, I don't know anything. I'm an intern and I have to- I was to about to say, also, things. you were an intern. Exactly. So, <laughs> but like I'm, adding that, like that is a lot of a pressure, that is a lot of pressure for an intern. But it, that shows you like what it's like. They yeah. need so much help with that process because there are so many refugees who need to be resettled and so few people and processes in place to like make that happen that they just need all the help that they can get which is why interns who know nothing like me <laughs> were often in the position of having to make those decisions so. wow that's just incredible not necessarily incredible in a positive way but just incredible in the scope of what they need and the their inability to get it wow right so i, I want to talk a little bit about um kind of tradition and family. Um, I feel like I loved that not only was Suad a character that really, she treasured she treasured the Quran and had read it so many times, read it multiple times a year. And so there was a lot of that, but there was also kind of her own um, family traditions that she would kind of create, such as um, kind of to celebrate her father's death she would make lentil soup for the family every year, like things like that, that I just thought was so touching and kind of emblematic of that, that um, insistent seems not quite like the right word, but that, that need to uh, hold on to tradition and to keep tradition alive, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of on the opposite end of, of, I think what her children are kind of dealing with, where they're not mm -hmm. thinking about that old stuff because 
there's too much new stuff going on. I mean, right. with technology and the um, and the protests and everything going on, like their energy is like very much in the future, while her energy is kind of sitting in the past. Um, and with all of these changes, she's just trying to understand and just trying to like work through how to deal with all of that. Um, and I was curious about kind of that dichotomy and what was the importance for you of representing that? Um, it's not something that I consciously thought of, but it flowed with the characters and you're right. There is this clear distinction between, you know, Suad is so stuck in the past, not only politically, but in her personal life. Um, mm -hmm. and I think, I think for her, it's, a form of control. She's stuck in this time period because it like, it's something that already passed. It already happened. She doesn't have to worry about, you know, how it's going to turn out, how it's going to unfold. Um, so I think for her, that's why she's obsessed with it. I think for Sammy, he doesn't think about the past because it's all very like pushed upon him or that's what he feels like. One of his earliest experiences that he recounts in the story is like, having to wash his grandfather's body um, after he died. And it's like, you know, probably an experience he would like to forget. And it's something that was forced, he felt forced upon him. Um, so it's really like, that's his experience up until that point in his life is not really being able to choose these experiences for himself, but not having the choice at all. So I think that's why for him, looking to the future represents like his first chance at autonomy really and it, you know it does mirror the politics of the situation too definitely definitely um so kind of leading off of that um there are a lot of differences between kind of the protests that we are seeing right now with the black lives matter movement um versus the kind of protests that were featured in the book during the arab spring um, just the fact alone that the communication such as like phones and the internet were shut down um, just creates like an entirely different form of organization that they had to do. Um, and I know that books take a very long time to publish. So obviously this book was written quite a few, not quite a few years ago, but definitely a few years ago before yeah. all of this, all, like all of 2020 happened. Um, and so I was curious about um, what your thoughts are on kind of this book coming out during this time. And how do you think that the book reflects or doesn't reflect um, what we're experiencing in America right now? I think that it does reflect it in a lot of ways. I think that um, I couldn't help but feel a lot of the similarities when um, the Black Lives Matters, pro Matters protests um, came up uh, or it started happening, reignited, I guess, this year. Um, I think it's like this similar feeling of anger, you know, rightful anger. And um, it's like a very organic movement. Like nobody has to tell people to go out there and demonstrate. Like in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, every other house has a sign in its window um, with, you know, some slogan from Black Lives Matter. Um, and it's like, nobody's telling people to do this. It's just a very organic, natural movement that I had never seen before in America. Um, like I used to live in DC and there would be protests by the White House all the time. And they were lame as hell. They were just like, <laughs> you know, a few people with signs that usually were like mass produced signs. And like, like nothing would happen. Nothing would come of them. They don't have any of the energy of like a real movement like that. But Black Lives Matter does. And it's also similar in the um, police brutality um, aspect because the Egyptian revolution also was sparked by that. Um, it's very different, of course, because like in the US we have the racial angle. There's like the historic oppression of black people in the US um, and you know mass incarceration, police brutality, all of the systemic abuses of black people that's not really um it's not a dynamic in egypt that but the idea of police brutality in itself impunity what that means to people i think that is a similar thread i think the difference is that 
in Egypt, it was kind of this feeling of like, you know, we're the 99% because we're talking about the regime versus everybody else. And the police are, you know, an arm of the regime. With Black Lives Matter, it's almost, it's, it's a much more difficult struggle, I think, because it's, you know, it's not about 99% versus the 1%. It's about, you know, minority groups um, struggling against, you know, systemic, institutionalized, multi-generational oppression. So it's not, I feel like it's, you know, it's almost easier in a way when it's like, it's all of us against one people, but, you know, there's so much, there's so many different dynamics at play. It's a much more, much more difficult fight in my opinion. And, you know, I also think I have a, a different perspective, of course, because it's happening in my country versus when I was in Egypt, I was the outsider looking in. Um, I feel like I literally was that person looking from the balcony at the protest there. And here, mm -hmm. it's my country. It feels less, you know, fun. Like I would have seen the Arab Spring because you're like, in a way, of course, it is fun. You know, it is. It's really incredible to have this kind of feeling among people to ha see this kind of organization among people. Um, this movement, that's fun. But you also know that there's like real implications behind it. There's, you know what's actually going to happen real you know i don't i was going to say real people which is absurd because of course real people were dying in uh, the air spring as well but you know it's like it just hits so much closer to home when it's your own country that it really just takes on a different tone for you um and another similarity sorry i'm just going off i've been thinking about this a lot if you can't tell no but, but it's i mean it's super fascinating to kind of break it down yeah <laughs> yeah it is it's really fascinating um because i don't think i'm the only person who thinks that there's a lot of similarities between these as well um mm -hmm. another big one i feel like is conspiracy theories and this kind of like the rumors the you know here there is so much when we talk about rioters and looters and things like that that's exactly the type of language that was used by the mubarak regime against protesters during the arab spring this kind of trying to paint everybody as a hooligan or a criminal so-called quote-unquote criminal um that's so similar and it's like to the point where like you don't know what to believe i mean of course i don't believe what's coming out of the white house not to get political but personally that's not what I would believe. But in terms of like what's actually happening on the street, you're like, I can't even listen to the news anymore because there's just so much spin on everything. And it's, you would never expect something like that to be the case here in the US, but it is. The US is really not too different at all. And we look at other countries too often, um, especially Middle Eastern countries, and we're like, oh, they're corrupt, they're brutal regimes, but it, like, look at our country. Look at how many black and brown people the police kill all, every single day and don't, there's no accountability at all. Sorry, I'm totally going off. I'm, so, <laughs> I'm just trying to no, say. No, don't be sorry. No, because I, I, I agree with you. Like, I think, I think books like this are so important. Like, that's what I wanted to talk about today was rebellion and fiction and yeah. kind of the importance of telling and or, like of talking about these stories because they do relate to the world we're currently living in and being able to read stories about mm -hmm. other places and finding those connections between what's going on there and what we're experiencing. And I feel like your book exactly. is such a great example of that. Right. I think that's a very important thing th that I hope readers would take away is the similarities. It's not, you know, it's never as simple as like the good guys or the bad guys. And, you know, like we're the good guys. I hear so much of the time um, people being shocked at what other countries do to their protesters or, you know, regular citizens just going about their lives. But I mean, I haven't really heard of anything as extreme as what's happening here with, you know, people just being murdered in cold blood and nothing being done about it. Like, it's kind of like we have the most absurd system here. 
So when you read about these other countries and the cases of police brutality that kicked off the Arab Spring, you know, they're, they're their own, you know, breed of violence, you know, but you can't help but read that. And you're like, wow, we, we're seeing these videos coming out, coming out like all the time in our country. And the stories that sparked the Arab Spring are, you know, they're farther away, they're more abstract. And here we have these exa examples that are like, you know, seemingly so much closer to home and more extreme because we have the, you know, video so much of the time of it happening. And you're like, wow, what does that mean? It could mean this country is so close to revolution, you know? We could be on the edge of that as well. So Exactly. And I do I do think that that's that's kind of the place where I think people a lot of people's heads are kind of at. So getting to, getting the opportunity to read a book like this, you know, it kind of helps to give us context for um, what these protests mean and kind of what's happening with them. Mm -hmm. By the way, just so you know, we have lost a little bit of video with you, but we oh. can still hear you. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, um. I'm going to try minimizing your video and then bringing it back. And we're going to see if maybe that can help bring you back. Okay. Oh, nope, didn't work. But hopefully oh, no. the internet will catch up. At least we can still hear you, though, which is good. <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I know technology can be such a pain, especially these days with all of these virtual events. So thank you for bearing with us, everybody. Technology! <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're actually, we're getting to the end. I only have one or two more questions. So if anyone would like to ask a question, make sure to pop it in the ask a question function right on the bottom of the screen. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the fact that this is your debut novel. Um, what was your favorite part of your publishing journey? And what was something that was the most uh, surprising part of your publishing journey? Um, I think favorite parts were along the way, finding people, partners to work with because writing, of course, is such a solitary activity and it kind of makes you feel like you're insane if you just keep at it for that long. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I um, started working with my agent, Christy Hunter, for this book, she, it was just felt so good to have like a validation in that way in terms of like another reader who's giving you feedback um and then also my editor jennifer pooley um she was also incredibly helpful in the process and it's something that i think that you really need writing because you get so your head gets so into it and you're so used to not talking to anybody for hours or days at a time that you really need these um partners in the whole process to kind of ground you that's not something that I expected um, to be a dynamic, but, I, you know, it was a surprising and, you know, very important one for me. Um, I also loved the book cover design process. That was really I fun. love this book cover. I'm it's so glad. Like, like, literally, I did an Instagram photo earlier of me with, like, this scarf because the scarf is kind of like a similar color family. Yeah. And I was just like, I love, I just think it's so beautiful. And I feel like it it expresses the story in a really lovely way. Yeah, I, it was so fun to help design. Luckily, I had a lot of say with that. Um, Blackstone's design team really was super collaborative. And I just remember for weeks going around my office and talking to all the graphic designers at work and being like, do you like this one or do you like that one? Or, you know, I just like was constantly <laughs> pulling people and it was just so fun. Um, but yeah, and then, it, yeah, and I think another surprising thing, that wasn't surprising. I feel like every writer probably expects that to be a fun part. But <laughs> one thing that is surprising me every day is the reality of having people read the story. <laughs> like, because I think <laughs> you almost don't even think about it when you're writing it. You're like, I just need to publish it. And that's that, you know? Then, you, <laughs> then like my dad's reading it. And I'm like, Dad, can you stop? Like, I really don't need you to read the story. <laughs> you know, or people that, you know, like, you know, I'm so grateful for everybody that I know who's reading it. But it's, it's like something that never even occurred to you when you start writing it. And you're like, whoa, people are going to be reading this and having thoughts and questions and assumptions and stuff. And like, you know, it's just a very strange, uh, 
you know, situation to find yourself in. You're like, oh, never thought of that. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I guess yeah. that's the life we're living now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, I have one more question for you. So I was curious if you have any um, book recommendations. It could be books about rebellion, but also just books maybe that you're excited about that you wanted to share with the people at the event today. Yeah, um, I just ordered a book from another author at my publisher, Asana Saad. She's another Iranian American author, and her book is called A Door Between Us. And it takes place in Iran after the Green Revolution of 20, 2009. I feel like in the Middle East, you just can't ignore politics. Like it's always gonna be a part of any story. But yeah. she said something that I found so um, important. She wrote that she wanted to write a story that um, would make it harder to go to war. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what we need. You know, so I really look forward to reading her story. Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, that's wonderful. That sounds like a really lovely book. So I just popped that book in the chat as well. So if you want, you can definitely click on that link and I'll take you to that. And then, of course, obviously, that green button below us will take you to uh, where you take us take you to our website where you can purchase spring. Uh, this book is so beautiful. It's so beautifully written. Um, and I really you. love the story. So I just I appreciate you so much for being here and talking to me today and talking about the tough, tough things that I think we right now are dealing with. And I just I appreciate you so much. Thank you. You too. Of course. Of and course. thank you to everybody who's been here. Yes, thank you all so much. It looks like we don't really have any questions today, but that's okay. I feel like we covered a lot of ground today, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I was all over the place. Sorry. <laughs> no, I meant that in a good way. I just meant like no, no, we no. talked about so much in such a wonderful way. I love this conversation. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you all so much for attending this event. Do not forget to hit that green button below to purchase the book. Um, you can also use the code EVENTS to get 10% off of your purchase today. Um, we hope to see you again for another one of our amazing events. We actually have a whole slew of events going on in September. Um, this month we are featuring voices, which means that we're featuring either own voices, authors, or distinct voices in literature, such as this amazing book today. Uh, we'll be continuing that with um, our next event on September 15th, which is an examination of American free speech with Ellis Kosey. Um, that is going to be an incredible conversation. I highly, highly recommend checking it out. You can check it out by going to our website, barbarasbookstore.com. Um, I believe if you also do barbarasbookstore.com slash events, you can find it as well. Um, and we also offer other events such as our um, new inclusive book club called Culture Exposure, where we discuss books that are written by marginalized people from marginalized communities. Um, our next one is happening on September 30th, which is a Wednesday. We do them the last Wednesday of the month at 6 p.m. and is featuring the book Your House Will Pay by Steph Che that came out last year. It's an incredible, incredible book. Um, I cannot recommend it enough. Please, please, please join us for that event. And thank you all so much again and happy reading. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.